For today's video, we're going to be talking about balance when it comes to single player games, and more specifically, when you're dealing with a game meant to be challenging, and how far do you want to go in terms of having great options, bad options, and those that are just completely overpowered. Normally for these videos, we start with the topic first and then go into the video game example later. But because this one is so intrinsic to our discussion, we're going to be doing things in reverse. So you have no interest in hearing about the Darkest Dungeon design and methodology, then skip forward, I'll have hopefully future Josh leave a timestamp somewhere up there. But when we talk about balance, it's typically viewed in the conversation of multiplayer games, because we're dealing with some level of symmetrical gameplay, player versus player being one of the most popular. There is some elements of asymmetry, usually in terms of like pistol versus shotgun, long range versus close range, and so on and so forth. But what's arguably more interesting and more challenging to do is when we talk about balance in a single player game, and this is when we get into more of full on asymmetrical design, where the player and the AI have distinct and unique advantages and disadvantages, and you don't have that one to one to draw back on or fall back on. It's not so much apples versus oranges, it's truck drivers versus seagulls or some other crazy combination. And this is why it becomes very hard, no pun intended, to balance a game when we're talking about something that's on the challenging side. And that's where Darkest Dungeon ran into a lot of issues in terms of high level play. Now, we're not going to chronicle the whole development and design of the game here, but what you need to know is that Darkest Dungeon was always built as a challenging dungeon crawling roguelike. Permadeath for characters, lots of ways for you to screw up intentionally and unintentionally, and a balance focused on the different classes in the game. Each class being completely different from the other ones in terms of skills, utility, and stats. Now, in Darkest Dungeon, the game essentially is designed to explicitly and implicitly punish you for playing it long, as in taking a very long time during combat. For one thing, enemies are designed to have critical hit chances, so the longer you spend in the battle, the greater the chance that you're going to get hit with a crit that can do massive damage. The other point, of course, is that you have stress and health damage. Both are not easily recoverable. So the longer you spend fighting, the harder it's going to be to keep going, especially in larger or longer dungeons. The other point is you spend too long in a battle, then you're going to run into cases where you'll start to get stress buildup or additional enemies may spawn in. So, the entirety of playing Darkest Dungeon, for all aspects of play, is to get through battles as quickly as possible and as unscathed as possible. And what ended up happening was there was definitely issues in terms of the balance between the characters and what Red Hook wanted to do with them. So, the big example, of course, is the Jester. The Jester was a character originally or put in when the game first went into early access, and was designed as a high risk slash supporting character. It had the best buffs in the game, and also had arguably the most hi the highest damaging attack in the game with its finale base attack. And the finale was designed so that you would do massive amounts of damage, and then the Jester would basically not be really able to do all that much for like three to four turns due to massive debuffs. So the pitch for the character, or for that attack, was that you would prepare the finale and then launch it to as kind of like the way of ending the battle, you know, finishing off a very strong enemy, so on and so forth. The problem, of course, was everyone saw this as a very powerful alpha strike that they could use on turn one, and that's what they did. They would give the Jester finale, put him in the, in the formation one spot, round one, use it, send them back to the row, and then start using buffs and stuff for the rest of the battle. And it worked. Again, you have the strongest attack that you can use on turn one. And this became the preferred play by many expert players. And that's one of the challenges when you ever you are dealing with the balancing in games like this. Expert players will figure out how to min-max your game perfectly. And that information is going to get out to the rest of the player base. 
So what Red Hulk did was massively nerf the Jester. They removed a lot of the damage bonuses from it, and instead backloaded it so that every time the Jester did another command, it would buff the finale. But there's a bit of a problem with that. One is that the finale misses, then you lose all the benefits of that attack that you spent three to four turns leveling it up. The second one is even more obvious. They turn an attack that was meant to be used on turn one, and it's something that takes several turns to pull off, in a game that punishes the player for taking a long time in combat. And this kind of is the major point when we talk about the balancing issues at high level play of Darkest Dungeon. That many of the characters were nerfed because they were considered too good or too powerful and it's really pigeonholed what options are viable when you're playing high level Darkest Dungeon play. Because again, you can't build a party that's designed to take 15 to 20 turns to be an enemy as you're going to be punished for that. And this was an issue that even after months of balance patches and content updates, Red Hook unfortunately never quite figured out that perfect balance, because it is very hard to do, and there is no such thing as perfect balance when we talk about asymmetrical gameplay. And this is something that I feel is going to become a major point whenever we get more information about Darkest Dungeon 2. But, with that said, when it comes to Darkest Dungeon, again, this was a game that was built around very challenging gameplay. That was the MO that you see on the very first screen when the game loads up. This is meant to be a hard game. You're not supposed to have an easy time playing it. And I know that is going to bring up a very special comment that we'll come back to in the second part. And when you're trying to build a game like this that's aimed at the hardcore or challenging side of things, it becomes very hard to figure out just how much do you give the player. Because there are players who have most lately beaten Darkest Dungeon on Blood Moon difficulty. They probably find the game easy by now, just as they found the game easier in the older versions, before the uh, Corpse update, and so on and so on. And you have to be really careful as a designer when it comes to both listening to and catering to that hardcore minority. Because no matter how hard you make the game, if you're dealing with a closed system and loop, they're going to figure out the best way of winning. It may take them a little bit, it may take them a long time, but they're going to do it. So, with that said, we're going to do our Patreon supporter and sponsor shout out now, and when we come back, we're going to talk more about this kind of imbalancing balance that comes to these kinds of games, and why you have to be really careful from a design standpoint. And now for a quick thank you to our current Game Wisdom sponsors and Patreon supporters. And if you'd like to continue the discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. Balance again in games that are meant to be on the hard side, or more specifically meant to challenge players, and I think that's the better way of saying it. Because we've had this discussion before that difficulty by itself does not make a game great. Again, it's how you're able to test the player's skill and mastery that ultimately will determine it. And you need to be really careful from a design standpoint in terms of how limiting you are in terms of the player's options and abilities to get around. As I said in the last part, that with expert level games, gamers are really amazing at figuring out the best ways of optimizing. As you can see, as this footage on my second row play goes through, as I will be kicking a lot of butt on screen here. But with that said, with these kinds of games, it's very easy as a developer to just keep thinking, if player figures out A, I'm gonna change it to B, and repeat this in an endless cycle, because that's how it's going to play out. As we've said before, when it comes to multiplayer-based games, that is a never-ending battle to avoid a stale meta. And the second you stop changing elements or not adding in any new content, your game becomes fixed, much in the same way as a single-player title is. 
that as soon as the players know that this is exactly how the game is going to play every time these are set and known values, you can begin to min-max and break it. And from a developer standpoint, this raises a very tough question. Do I let the player break my game? Because there are serious discussions both for and against this. For developers who are trying to get as many people to play their game as possible, they can leave broken or overpowered elements in as a way of kind of as a reward for ferrying them out, or they may not even realize it and it's too late to change. But for games like Darkest Dungeon, Sekiro, Dark Souls, and you name it, that are meant to be a challenging affair, it can almost seem like the players have almost like destroyed your game. With Darkest Dungeon, there were legitimately overpowered ways of playing that game. Again, characters like the Man at Arms, Jester, and the Flagellant were OP in their original versions, and people figured that out very quickly. And so what Red Hook did was nerf them in various ways. And while this can be a solution, it's been considered that for a lot of people that it's better to buff more options than it is to nerf the offending one. Now, with Sekiro here, with the footage that I'm showing you, this is me basically beating these fights with raw skill. You'll notice that I'm not using any of the games, the prosthetic tools, or a lot of the bonus things that are meant to make the game easier. And there's a very important point here that Sekiro also fails on. The bonus items or bonus tactics in this game are very limiting in their use. You have a set currency to use prosthetic tools. That's at 15 you see in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. And it runs into this issue that it's kind of a half measure to allow more people to play it. For the expert people like myself and others who figure out Sekiro, we're never going to use prosthetic tools unless it's to cheese a specific fight. For new players who have problems trying to learn the game or aren't good enough to play the game at this level, you run into this problem that those options are too limiting to really help them. And again, this is a very tough point about these kinds of games. That if you're trying to make a game that's challenging, how do you afford or give the player enough means to get around these situations? One of the problems for a lot of people who started to play early action games, those of like the thousands, was that there was no buffer to those games. There's no leveling up, you can't grind for more health, basically you get to a boss that you can't win, you're done. You are not going to be able to play that game. And it can become very frustrating from a design standpoint because you must walk that line between I want this game to be challenging, but I still want people to be able to figure things out and play them. And you always have to give players, either subtly or overtly, a way to get through it. This was one of the issues I had with the La Mulana franchise, that many of the design choices in that game are difficult for the sake of making the game difficult. It's not about providing a fair challenge or an interesting one. There are rules and mechanics in that game that are never spelled out. There is no hints whatsoever about how they work in-game. And the only ways you're going to figure that out are either looking it up on a guide or just literally messing with things and hoping that you figure or you hope that you can get that solution. And that's not how you want to design a game in my opinion. Again, games that are challenging afford multiple ways of getting through them, as well as being interesting in those ways. One of the issues that Darkest Dungeon and Sekiro ran into, again, is that there are legitimately best ways of beating every boss. There's no argument, there's no discussions. It's if you do it like this, your game experience will be a lot easier for it. And when you have those one ways or, or those pigeonholed strategies, it tends to make those games worse, in my opinion. 
because of the fact that it makes it one-sided. You either do X or you fail. And if you try to do anything else, again, it's just not going to work. Darkest Dungeon especially had that issue in the final dungeon. The final dungeon consists of three set floors with fixed bosses in them, as well as, of course, the final boss that occurs after. And like we said, whenever you have set elements in your game, that creates a known for the player to exploit. And so for people who got amazing at Darkest Dungeon, they know the best party builds to take into those three dungeons to make it easier. And there's no other way of getting around it. You may get very lucky with an unoptimal or inoptimal party to get through those sections, but it's going to be a lot harder and a lot more frustrating for you. With that said, to begin to wrap things up, when you're trying to balance single player content, you always have to be aware of how players of varying skill levels will be able to get through it. If you're aiming your game to be on the challenging side, you need to be aware of just how hard that game is. And it's rarely good to listen to the hardcore minority when it comes to difficulty. Because just because 5% of your player base beat your game easily, that doesn't mean the other 95% are going to have the same time. And it's very important to be aware of not touching beginner or open areas in terms of difficulty. If somebody says that your opening is too easy, don't even bother listening to that statement because you want your opening to be as inviting and as easy to get into as possible. Again, nobody should make the dark souls of tutorial sections. That's not how you want your game to be. And if you cater too much to the hardcore minority, you can easily push players away who are being overwhelmed or frustrated by your design. And again, even with that said, just because your expert players can figure things out doesn't mean that it's going to be something that can be solved for easy or for novice players. Too often when we see games that are bound to round challenge, that they fail to ignore essential onboarding and playability lessons. And even with something like Dark Souls, as anyone knows who's played that game, Dark Souls gets easier the longer you play it as you learn the rules and mechanics of it. The same thing with Sekiro here. This fight took me forever when I first played the game. Now, or after I get back to practice, I can be it fairly easily without even needing to work with any prosthetics. But if the player can't get to that point of understanding and mastery, if they're either frustrated by the design or overwhelmed, then you're never going to be able to get them to see that. And it's often in these challenging and hard games that developers don't think about that. They think that the game is hard, therefore challenging players are going to love it and they're never going to figure it out. But again, that never happens. The longer your game is out, people are going to figure out the most optimal ways of playing it. And this is incredibly true thanks to speedrunning. The whole growth of speedrunning culture over this past decade has also given more players the opportunity to see behind the current and start playing games at the breaking level of it. And as we've said, players will figure this stuff out. Doesn't matter how long it takes, they will learn the best ways of playing your game and they're going to break it. With that said, thank you so much for watching this video. For those of you who are watching right now, my question for you is what do you think about balance in these kinds of games? Should developers be more open to having game breaking options or affordances in the game? Or if a game is meant to be challenging, then should it just be challenging all the way through? But thank you so much for watching. If you have a topic you'd like to suggest for an upcoming video, please don't hesitate to get in touch and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where in the art and science of games. I could let this footage run and let you watch me beat this fight, but 
just assume that I kicked its butt a second time. Until next time, take care. If you're looking for more wisdom about game design, be sure to check out my latest offering of books, 20 Essential Games to Study, aimed for first-time developers and students looking for some inspiration for their upcoming games, and Game Design Deep Dive Platformers if you're interested in anything regarding 2D and 3D platforming design. They're both available in print, digital, and wherever books are being sold. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design. And come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it. And tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.